Hey everyone, how's it going? My name's Mayuko and welcome back to my channel where we talk about tech, career, and life. So as you may know, I'm someone who came up to software engineering through pretty traditional methods and paths, who then went on to Silicon Valley to work as a software engineer building products. But I do think that one of the best parts about coding and software engineering is that you can apply it to anything. But because of the path that I've taken and the people that I've met through my path, sometimes it's hard for me to imagine all the other ways you can use code. Like I had questions about how do you get into other fields with coding? Is coding a natural part of the field or have people figured out ways to use coding as part of their job? And like what technologies do they use? What skills are important? And how has technology change the way that they work. So welcome to like a new show or segment or series that I'm tentatively calling The Merge, where I talk to someone who uses coding in a way that you might not expect. I'm actually not sure how this will go or where it'll go or if it's gonna continue, but I figured why not try and see how things go. And specifically today, we're gonna talk about the intersection of coding and glaciers. That's right, glaciers, like the big chunks of ice. <laughs> I recently met someone through my Twitch stream who told me that he uses coding and the Pomodoro method to do his work in glaciology. And I was just so intrigued by that because I never even thought about using coding and technology in a field like that. So I wanted to learn more. I hosted this as a live stream a couple weeks ago. And so today I'm gonna bring you some of the highlights and the best parts of that conversation to you. And so before we dive in and talk to Michael Shaheen, my friend who is a PhD student in glaciology, I wanted to thank the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Skillshare is for real working creatives and lifelong learners. Their classes include a combination of video lessons and a class project, and their classes fit to your schedule and skill level. Most classes are under an hour and members get unlimited access to thousands of inspiring classes with hands-on projects and feedback from a community of millions. And so maybe some of you are starting off in your coding journey this year, and I recommend a course by Rich Armstrong called Hand Coding Your First Website, HTML and CSS Basics. HTML and CSS is a great place to start, and so definitely check out his course. Only the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring, and now let's dive in and learn about glaciers. I guess a more of a textbook definition of what is glaciology, I would just say it's simply the study of ice sheets and glaciers. How ice moves, changes, and evolves throughout time. Simply put, glaciology. So I was actually a computer science major when I entered my undergraduate. And to make that even more, I kind of wanted to be a software engineer in high school. I think my sophomore year, that's when I took like my first anything like programming or yeah. So I, I was kind of on that track. And so I started as a computer science major. It was about three semesters in. I was like, I'm actually kind of tired of this. <laughs> and my intro geology professor was like, oh, there's some really interesting overlap with computer scientists and then earth science. and. It was, again, it was kind of like that image you had of like someone in Antarctica with like doing cool, doing something cool with like ice an instrument. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't say ice, pitch, <laughs> but there's some instrument there, and I was like, wow, that's actually kind of the questions I'm like looking at. I wanted, I wanted to ship something a little less of a, I, know, I guess, an artificial science, like something that's not physical mm -hmm. and something more physical based. And I was curious about climate change, and I thought that was an interesting intersect I could do because I felt confident on a computer. Like I took Python, I took you know Java, and all this. I talked to my future advisor in geology. He was like, do you like satellites? And I was like, I have nothing against them, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of how I got started in uh, geology. And, and I was actually researching in the Virgin Islands uh -huh. as an undergrad, so not polar regions at all. Virgin Islands is pretty tropical, isn't it? It's in the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. so there's no but ice. <laughs> there's no yeah. ice. No, I didn't do anything with yeah, ice yeah, then. Yeah. Doing more of a geographic information systems and remote sensing. So essentially, like I was mapping and modeling chlorophyll distribution in, in around coral reefs with respect to coral bleaching and climate change. Mm -hmm. I got 
kind of bored of that too, honestly. And I kind of found glaciology on my own. I just, I, there is a few textbooks in the, the college of Charleston where I got my undergrad in, in uh, glaciers and glaciation, the physics of glaciers. I had these two books and I was taking a structural geology course. And that's about faults. Think about like faults and like rocks rubbing against each other, which is essentially a glacier sliding on its bed. Mm-hmm. And I kind of just fell in love with it since wow. then. Wow. Rented it. I spoke from the library. I was like, wow, this is really sweet. Yeah. And then now you're doing your PhD in it. Now I'm doing my PhD. I kind of cold call, uh, cold emailed my potential advisor. I was like, hey, you do really cool stuff. Do you have a spot for me? Wow. And she was like, yeah, there's this really cool LIDAR system we have at Helheim Glacier. Do you know about LIDAR? I was like, yeah, I'm somewhat familiar with LIDAR. She's like, you're on. I was like, sweet. Dope. Wait, this is such like a, like, one thing led to another, and now yeah. I'm doing glaciers kind of story. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so, like, that, that, um geology course that you were taking as an undergrad was that just kind of like a general education requirement like that's a common, yeah, that was... common thing that people at your university were taking so okay first my day-to-day yeah yeah day in the life of um, a student in glaciology <laughs> let's do this oh i love these <laughs> aside from getting ready for the day i'll say my first working bit would be i try to read or write in the morning i just feel more more motivated to do that so catching up the literature writing a proposal or after lunch that's when i get more technical and i get in my we get my ide i use spider if people are interested in whatever ides i use and this is a python a scientific python environment um it depends on i guess what task i'm at so with processing the lidar the point clouds if anyone's not familiar with lidar it's um it's in that new iphone 12 pro mac it's a lazy that essentially you shoots lasers at a surface and it bounces back and then you can calculate the two-way travel time and from that distance you cal- you can know the position so you have a collection of points yeah. that represent a three-dimensional surface and that's a point cloud that's what lidar produces i use numpy pandas scipy matplotlib for visualizations if not seaborn or something um and then getting more into the geographic uh, or more geospatial packages gdal the uh, geospatial data abstraction library pdal or i call it poodle that's how it was introduced to me the same thing with gdal except for point clouds and those are the tools i typically use on a day-to-day what i do with that um calculate um displacements between points um i make digital elevation models dms that are just more of a gridded um, it's a gridded product from the points and this is all well, the points being of a glacier so you're tracking like how glaciers change over time, how they move, how much they move through all of that technology. It's, it sounds a lot kind of just like data science, honestly. Like you have a lot of it, data and you're trying to get the patterns from that using all of it. I think honestly, just how they move mm. is still a question. I think honestly, just how they move mm. is still a question of debate in a sense in glaciology because glaciology is still a pretty immature field oh. uh, like meaning like it like modern glaciology is kind of founded in the 50s compared to like you know physics or mathematics from like thousands yeah. of years yeah. with at least what i do with lidar um, i study that process of glacier to iceberg called calving mm-hmm. just like a cow calves a baby cow <laughs> like a glacier calves an iceberg yeah oh that's so cute bergy bit. bits and calving <laughs> yeah <laughs> understanding that process calving one you want to parameterize that so we could project future rates of sea level rise Mm. also simply just how ice fractures is still debatable like there's not really it's kind of hard to measure these things in the field because again the scales are so large and they're also hard to get to yeah yeah One of the biggest stereotypes is kind of what you point out, like ice pick right. <laughs> on a on an ice sheet. And to be fair, that's just kind of how the field's presented. Mm. I mean, it's not accurate, but that's just what I'll say. That's probably the most common thing. And I'll say that's pretty bad misrepresentation of the field because glaciologists don't have to go on Greenland and Antarctica. Like most of us work in a IDE, like Spider or something, and on a computer writing code to process this data and or model glacier behavior. And so it's really more computational than field-based i would say and that's kind of why i wanted to do this anyways too because i'm like i never thought of myself as that different from your community yeah <laughs> until i was like kind of pointed out like hey you're different i was like oh yeah that's a good question because like what i said before i wanted to be like the silicon valley software engineering life growing up at least in high school 
in early college. And would I change that now? Um, I still want to stay in academia. I, I think my trajectory would be finding a postdoc and then finding um, a tenure track position, knock on, on the wood somewhere. <laughs> but I have entertained the thought of doing more of like a open source geospatial software developing gig. No, no, when I'm done with my PhD, hopefully I could do something like that because I work with a lot of um, software developers too. Interesting. And I really like the open source geospatial software dev community. They're a lot of fun. Yeah. Does is does it? Uh, my first guess is that it gets like that kind of technology gets used in stuff like VR. But like, how? Kind of tell me more about that. I don't think I know very much about geospatial in the sense of like mapping things in the world. Hmm. How do you know where something is mm -hmm. in space? Mm -hmm. And how do you express um, that with data? And like, how can you exactly. model it in software? I'm guessing. Exactly. Like, so solving problems like how much, like the, there's like the commercials, like how much crop yield they're going to have when you have like, like the IBM commercials or something like that. Like that's using like a GIS and a remote sensing based system. Mm. It sounds so like a really a direct application of programming to the rest of the world. It's like literally how do you bridge exactly. that gap? Because you are trying to create like modern the reality in which we live in onto computers it's yeah isn't it like wild that it's like you know we all talk about programming and coding as if it's this one thing but like the way that you use it and the other skills around it are like really define kind of what you do because like you and i we write code but like for massively different ways and like if i sat in your seat and you sat in my seat we'd both just be like oh, i don't know what's going on <laughs> That's that's tough and that's a good question. Um, I guess I can only speak from my experiences and myself. If you are if you love technology and you like coding, but you don't want to necessarily follow the Silicon Valley software engineer route, then I think there are some really good transferable skills you have in the earth sciences mm -hmm. or in the geospatial community. And so maybe you can look somewhere else and apply your skills there. And also the, the problems, it's still problem solving nonetheless. And it's really cool. And I think the community needs people like Mayuko's audience out there to tackle these problems. Not necessarily glaciology. If you're really interested in glaciers, ice and climate change, then by all means look into it. And you can even contact me, please. <laughs> but Well, there are a lot of challenges in academia. Honestly, there's a lot of um, barriers and you see a lot of more like bad things like swept under the rug. I feel like the higher you go mm -hmm. in academia, as far as um, diversity issues and well, just DEI, Jedi in general, sometimes you might have a great mentor. I'm thankful that I have a great mentor in my advisors. Um, and I'm, I can't speak in industry. I'm assuming it's kind of prevalent everywhere, but specifically in academia, it can be really hard. Also, it's just a huge privilege because you don't make as much money as you would in the industry. You're kind of just fueled by your mentorship, self-motivation. And that's like, that's kind of like what you keeps you going. Um, and then maybe that gets sick and tired after a while and the positions just aren't readily available. So you have to really dedicate yourself. And if that's not for you, hopefully you can find it out in industry. When you were deciding to go for your PhD in glaciology, like considering all those factors, were you like, you know what? I still really freaking like glaciers, so I'm gonna do it. Like, what was your thought process in that? So honestly, it was probably a little bit of hubris. I was like, probably way too overconfident <laughs> at first. I was like, <laughs> but I'm, I'm ultimately glad I still made the decision. Um, I just love learning, I guess, in academic settings too, not even just about science or STEM fields, but like being in that environment where I could like go learn about some classics or like watch like a poetry reading or do something like that. I kind of just like that environment. I don't know, it, it's, it's fun too, because you're really independent as a PhD student. Like I can like, oh, like I, I've never used this Python package. I don't know this technology. Let me just spend a day or two learning it. You know, there's no one like screaming at me that I have to do something else at that time. I'm just, you know, yeah. kind of thinking of my own applications to solve a problem right. by myself. And, and like I just consult with my advisor. Yeah, that flexibility sounds that, really nice and not something that you can yeah. find anywhere in the industry for sure. Thank you everybody so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like this series and you want to see more, definitely leave a comment down below. And thank you so much again to my friend Michael for being in my video. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe this video. It doesn't necessarily help the algorithm or something, but I'm almost at 400k subscribers and I'd love to have you be one of them. I hope that y'all are doing well and staying safe and taking care and I will see you next time. Bye!